Imagine these are magnetic tiles on a whiteboard, okay? They're not, that's just an image. But if you entertain that, that's conceptual thinking. That's a good thing. And we're going to use these for a variety of purposes. I, one of the best things I did in my career occurred year six when I introduced student numbers to my classroom. Anybody using student numbers in your classroom? Wow, it'll revolutionize your room. 95% of teachers who try student numbers never go back. It's too effective. And if you've never tried numbers, let us reassure you, they're not harsh, they're not impersonal, there's no loss of identity. In fact, right there, that 14, that tells me Jesse Vincent, rock star student. But she was always called Jesse. All of our interactions are name-based. But the fact that Jesse wrote a 14 next to her name on her assignment helped me stay on top of things, keep things organized. And if it helps, now that we're in uh, March Madness, team numbers, whatever you want to call them. I'll tell you this though, Jesse loved the fact the books were numbered. My first five years of teaching without numbers, books all look the same, which is fine, until a student lost a book. Now, school policy was, you lose a textbook, you buy a new one. So Calvin's lost his science book. Contemplating the possibilities. Well, I could ask mom for 40 bucks for a new science book, and she's going to beat me. Oh, no, wait, look at all the science books that look just like mine. And you take somebody else's book, and now I've got two students fighting over whose book it is. Play Solomon on that one, I dare you. And we always blame the guys for whatever reason that is. I don't know why that is. That's not your book, Steve. It's hers. Give it to her and find yours. Then two days later, Heather's going, oh, I found my book, Mr. Morris. Oh, then I guess, Steve, that actually was your book in the first place. Sorry. Sorry about that. No, see, they could have solved that themselves. We're going to talk about six core principles of effective teaching. One is that students are problem solvers. See, Steve could have said, no, baby, this one's mine. It's got a 14 on it. Yours has a five. I'll help you find it. That means your stuff is safe. That makes us a better place. All right, here we go. Up on the whiteboard, we're going to use it in this situation to keep track of assignment completion. So, let's draw a finish line. I like the vis-a-vis -vis pen because it doesn't get wiped out if kids drag the tile over. Give them a collection box, lid to a case of Xerox paper, ideal for that. So students right now are on task. Jessie finishes, gets up, drops her assignment in the box lid, moves her tile across the finish line. And without a word, she's saying, hey, I'm done. Anybody else want to step up? Do the right thing? Because if you think about it, completion rates are almost invisible in the classroom. From the moment you say you may begin until the time is up, your students basically have no idea where they are on that race. And it's not a race, it's a journey from start to finish. Am I far ahead of everybody, the way Jesse was? Am I far behind everybody? I got no idea. But as students complete the assignment, and what a good use of freedom that is to get up from your seat and hand in an assignment. In the book I brought with me, the big book, it talks about asynchronous collection. You don't always want to collect something at the same time. They don't all finish at the same time. Hey, if you're done with it, process it. Move on to something else. Let's go. Because as kids finish, tiles are being moved. That's a heads up to the entire class. And when the time is up, you need to know who's done and who's not done. That's especially true at the secondary level. If you've told them that assignment's due before you leave today, you got to know right away. I couldn't do this my first five years without numbers. I tried, didn't work. I told my students, hey, that assignment's due before lunch. Goes in the box. And then right before lunch, my only verification process would be to count the assignments to see if I had 30 of them. And if I was missing three, I had no idea who it was, and that was pushing all my pirate buttons. You know, the beauty of numbers and why teachers keep using them is their structure to numbers. It's easy to verify whether kids are doing this the right way. Because all I have to do is give the assignments to one of my students. Hey, John, you want to collate these? Oh, sure, Mr. Morris. He's going to collate them from 1 to 30. Then he's going to slap a post-it on the top with the numbers of the missing assignment. I ask you, what's wrong with that picture? Yeah, shouldn't that tile really be over there? 
Because here's the harsh reality. In the obedience-based classroom, a lot of students are thinking this. What can I get away with? Not what's good for me. Not what makes me a better person or a better student. But what can I get away with? And they figure out right away, you can't mess with the numbers. There's no getting away from that. And I'll counsel those three kids privately, but leave everybody else alone. And the next time you need to use it for a different assignment or whatever it might be, you got to have at least one OCD kid in your classroom. Track him down. Track him down. <laughs> Young man, if I got a job for you, you're going to love this job. Love this job. And you all go back. And as you use ideas, you'll begin to modify them. Don't expect that right away, but over time, you'll modify ideas. That's why I teach generic stuff, and then you run with it. But see, if Calvin persisted in that not doing it the right way, what I would probably do is draw a line under all the numbers, put his tile down there and see him privately. Young man, your tile is below the line, which means from now on, before you hand it in, I'd like to see it. Now, you shouldn't have to do that. You shouldn't. But I want to help you this year. And until you don't need me anymore, let me know. But until then, I want to see it. And then as soon as he's got it dialed in and realizes I'm serious, and Mr. Morse isn't going away, he's not going to give up on me, Get it back up where he belongs. Now, that wasn't freedom within framework. That's a crazy good way to get a handle on that flood of paperwork coming your way on a daily basis. This modification is. Got this from a fourth grade teacher in Bakersfield. She says, I don't have a finish line. I've got a grid. And when students finish, they indicate what they're going to do next. She says, because of that, Rick, I never hear this anymore. If you have students who ask you, what do I do now? Those are students who have grown up in obedience-based classrooms. They're basically saying, think for me. I know we talk about thinking in here, but it's not really required. I just ask my teacher everything. That'll wear you out. And by the way, elementary guys, if you got a may-do, must-do list, I'm going to ask you to maybe rethink that. I'm a big fan of may-do. That sounds like fun and freedom. Must-do, way too obedience-based. And the unspoken message of must-do is this. I don't trust you guys to do the right thing. I guess I have to force you to. No, you can do that whole may-do, must-do with that grid. Just don't be surprised when Calvin finishes and chooses studying. Ignores his other unfinished assignments. Oh, I'm going to study. I like studying. I like studying. There's no product to produce. There's no end point to it. I'm just going to study. So that's your job to intervene. Yo, buddy, studying, huh? Excellent. That's admirable. But have you finished your other assignments? Now, but see, I, I chose study. I realize that. But maybe set the studying aside until your other stuff is finished. But that's part of that journey he's going to experience this year on how to be happy and productive. Which he's never, maybe he's never been that in class.